Hello, and welcome to Speaking of Authors. I'm Susan Tarnowski, the host from the city of Edina. In Speaking of Authors series, we try to tell all of the stories. The story an author has written, the life an author has lived, the stories that the readers remember as they are reading or listening to books. And today, we're going to look at the stories from the past. We're going to be joined today by Barbara Lavalour, our interviewer, who's a photojournalist and a memoirist, and our guest is University of Minnesota Emeriti Professor Jack Zipes. Jack has spent a lifetime looking at children's literature, particularly fairy tales and fantasy books in the beginning, for special messages that impact the social development and reflect the social conditions of our world. His mission statement describes that very clearly, and I'd like to read that as we begin. As he looked at fairy tales and fantasies, he said, I realized what my new mission in life was. I was a born-again grave digger. Normal grave diggers dig graves to keep people silent forever. I dig graves so that dead authors and artists can rejoin us and have an honest word with us. I do not want to silence the dead or ignore them. I want to pay homage to them, especially the writers, illustrators, and artists of all kind. Jack feels strongly about his own commitment, and I think you'll sense that in the interview coming up. I hope we will. So I'd like to introduce our two guests today, Barbara Lavalour. Hello, Barbara. How are you? I am great. I'm really happy today to be having this conversation with Jack. So we'll bring Jack on Mm -hmm. and introduce him to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Susan, for that great introduction. And we are so excited to meet and greet Jack Sipes. So welcome, Jack. It's great to have you here. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. You're so welcome. Wow, what a fun project you are, you're involved in, I, if I can call it a project. Uh, it it uh, certainly is. <laughs> yes. You, you've taken on editing children's books and bringing authors from decades ago back into today's conversation. So please do tell our viewers uh, a bit about yourself, first of all, and then your, um, and including your background, and how this process came to be. Uh, when I began uh, teaching at uh, New York University, this was in the uh, uh, late 1960s, I um, was really interested. I had not studied children's literature or socialization of children, but I was very interested in why and how uh, we actually got into the Vietnam War, and uh, what was it that, uh, uh, why was there such a divide between young and old at that time? I mean, uh, the protests against the Vietnam War was mainly uh, SDS and uh, throughout the country, and uh, um, that led at one point, uh, because I was a bad boy and led a strike at uh, New York University. Oh I my. was <laughs> Well, I, I, it was worth it. Everything I did at NYU. What I became very interested in was why this protest did not continue to develop. And what was it that um, after uh, stopping the, our, our participation in this war, what was it that prevented, or not prevented, that uh, did not carry over uh, into society so that uh, we wouldn't be involved in any other wars as we have been? And uh, I realized that it was uh, 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 that children uh, had to be socialized in a very critical way so that they uh, could become narrators of their own lives. I really uh, was able to write uh, with conviction that uh, uh, really what we feed our children is, and and I'm talking about at school, (laughs) the subject matter, uh, is significant for the future of of our country, of our society. And so uh, 
uh, I began writing books about folk tales and fairy tales and the effects they have on children and how we can use these tales uh, not to preach to them, but so that they can start thinking critically about their own situation. And so uh, the, my first books were like The Trials and Tribulations of Little Red Riding Hood, Fairy Tales and the Art of Subversion, uh, The uh, Enchanted uh, enchanted uh, uh, Spectacular Tales of the Brothers Grimm, and so on. And um, uh, this led to uh, a, a, my translating books that uh, I thought were important, uh, contemporary books mainly, or, and, and also philosophers uh, in different languages. Herb Cole, one of the great educators of the 1960s, a radical, who had been actually in St. Paul and had... Uh, developed the open, uh, this this was again in the late 60s where he had developed the open uni- open schools system in St. Paul. Uh, he was a good friend of mine and he happened to come to uh, Mo- uh, Minneapolis uh, at a time when a good friend of mine became, Peter Brosius, became the mm-hmm. head yes. of the Children's Theater yes. Company. Yes, I know Peter. And, yeah, mm-hmm. and Peter and I had done some work before and mm-hmm. and he had used a lot of my political plays that I'd written for children mm-hmm. and at any rate herb came herb gave a uh, a talk at uh, at that time I think it was hungry mine uh, bookstore mm-hmm. in St. Paul mm-hmm. and I brought Peter there and afterwards we had a beer together and and herb just overwhelmed <laughs> Peter and uh, and Peter wanted to hire him to direct plays, Shakespeare plays, at the theater. And uh, it's uh, because I'd been doing this for 30 years now in Milwaukee, also abroad, wherever I went, I, I did storytelling mm-hmm. and uh, developed my own, my own methods, which I, I published in two books. Uh, one was creative storytelling and another, another was speaking out. Okay. I'm going to ask you yes. to hold that thought. Okay. Because I've got a, a lot of questions. Okay. So Great. I want to be able to ask those. So um, you mentioned earlier on when you started speaking about SDS, and I would just like to say for our younger uh, viewers, yes. uh, SDS, Students for a Democratic Society, uh, very, very worth looking up yes. uh, uh, for those who have no idea what the SDS was in the 60s, mostly. Yes. Um, it, it's a, it would be a good history lesson for you to look up, I'm just <laughs> suggesting. All right. So the four books that you sent to yes. us to, to look at were yes. Needle the Great, yes. uh, Yusuf the Ostrich, right. Teddy the Little Refugee Mouse, yes. and The Magic Herb. Yes. And you have four more um, uh, either in the works or forthcoming, yes. I think I read. Uh, which ones are those? Oh, well, well, I have two coming out January 1st. Uh, one is Tistu, uh, the boy with green fingers of peace. Okay. And the other is a revision of Bambi, uh, uh, A Life in the Forest. Uh, a, a really, it'll be a controversial book because I... I the book is really shows that the Disney uh, Corporation uh, did some perverse work <laughs> on the original novel that came out in 1921. Uh, and the author, Felix Salton, is not known by anyone. It's a wonderful book, and that's coming out. Both of them are coming out January 1st. Awesome. That's, yeah. um, that's terrific. Um, so one question I had when I, I was thinking about our time together today was, yes. What is the difference, or perhaps significance is a better word, uh, between adapted and edited? Because this, uh, in your books, yes. it says edited <laughs> yes. by Jack Sipes. Yes. But what's the difference between those two? Well, it, uh, it, it depending, uh, like the both book, both of the books that are coming out, I translated uh, from French, mm-hmm. and the other was uh, uh, from German. Uh, Austrian German, which is very difficult for, it than, is. than German, <laughs> as, it you, is. as you know yourself. Yeah. And uh, so uh, those two books uh, are basically totally the books I've worked on. In, in other words, 
uh, it may be written by a, another author, a German author or Austrian author, French author, and so on. But uh, essentially, these are books that uh, I really uh, sort of shape, and uh, my let us say ideology is very clear in in, the, in those books. There were some interesting, um, but I thought more adult-like takes in these books, and every one of them actually. Uh, for example, in Needle, um, and this is a quote, when we keep the power to laugh in their faces, the bullies will shrink away yes. as we retain our integrity and yes. humanity. Yes. Any comments about that? <laughs> yes. Well, I tend to, the books that I have uh, been rediscovering uh, are books from the interwar years, uh, basically from the First World War through Second World War. And I've purposely chosen books that are for both both adults and children. In mm-hmm. other words, I really wouldn't call these books children's books, although children can read them and I hope will read them. Uh, but uh, they are definitely also for uh, for for adults. And the the Keto book that uh, I I published uh, is a, a really a, a more for adults than it is for children. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, but I hope that it's all about fascism. It's all about yes. how fascism develops in a particular country. Right. So, um, uh, yes, I, I, I think it would be great for adults, par- parents and children or grandparents uh, to read together yes. some of these books. Yes, um, I agree. And I, I was thinking, do children, I mean, do you, know, I, do you even know this, do children think it's strange that animals speak in this case, English, uh, and a dress in human clothes. Yes. <laughs> Have you ever asked a child? I couldn't help but think that when yeah. I was reading them. Yeah. Most children until maybe eight or nine, uh, maybe and may, maybe even to ten, uh, really accept the fact that, that animals speak. Yeah. There's no problem with that. Yeah. Well, I... I actually think animals do speak, uh, and a lot of people can understand what they're saying. For example, I have two grand dogs, and I know exactly what they're saying when they, um, you know, when, when they want to go out to walk and when they want to eat, yes, <laughs> as do most dog owners, I'm sure. Um, so I think you've uh, really answered one of the questions that I had was, are these books subtly or not so subtly written for adults? Yes. Um, because I think that they are a valuable yes. uh, reading for adults as well. Um, I was quite taken by Burroughs' ability to explain and defend animal rights, which is, of course, a topic of great interest in today's world. Um, Would you um, like to say anything about that? Yeah. Yeah, Dorothy Burroughs is definitely forgotten and neglected. She wrote and illustrated her books in the 1940s, you know, during the Second World War. And she had originally started out as a uh, an artist who did posters for the London Zoo in the 1920s. And she f- saw how uh, we drained, we have drained, uh, let us say, the spirits of animals. Mm. So that uh, she, uh, she, when, when she saw how they were caged and treated at the zoo, she vowed that uh, she would never write or draw anything afterwards uh, of, of human beings because she, she felt that really animals are more humane than humans. And so the two books that I've published, uh, 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 the uh, one book, uh, it's, uh, uh, The Magic Herb, is, uh, really reflects how uh, a family of boys get together to save one of their brothers, and then uh, the uh, book about the uh, the mouse who uh, uh, travels away from London because the bombs are coming to London, and uh, is is a wonderful story also that involves the animals working yeah. together. I, I brought I brought my little mouse. I'm re- renamed this mouse Teddy in honor of Teddy, the little refugee mouse. And I totally enjoyed reading that story. Yes. 
Um, another interesting fact is that Burroughs didn't portray humans in her books, as you mentioned. Right. Um, so I thought I thought that was interesting. Now I have a better understanding of of why. Yes, you're <laughs> yeah. <good. laughs> so um, I, I'd like to talk about your mission statement, yes. uh, which is in the back of each of these books. Uh, it stems from a conversation you had with your wife when she said to you, it's either me or the books. <laughs> now, that is a story I want to hear. Okay. <laughs> so would you tell us a little bit about the story behind it's uh, either me or the books? Yes, right. Well, in uh, 2008, I retired from the University of Minnesota, mm -hmm. and I had a, a library of 10,000 books in our, oh in our home. <laughs> And, oh my. And, and even though my wife is a writer and reads a great deal, uh, she said, you know, uh, we, we're getting old and we're probably going to have to move uh, within the next uh, several years. Uh, and either, but, but definitely, so we should prepare for this. And the first thing to go will be the books, your books. <laughs> And, Yikes! <laughs> and I said, no, no. no. And she, she said, look, uh, either you get rid of the books or you're going to go uh, out of that. Mm. And so uh, at that point, uh, we made various compromises and uh, that, uh, to a certain extent, led me to uh, think of all the books that I uh, had acquired uh, that from England, uh, from France, from Germany, and so on, and that these are books I still wanted to translate. So I, I managed to compromise and and uh, was allowed to keep about two thousand <laughs> books. That that was quite a compromise for you too. And I, I'd like to um, uh, I'll use Teddy as my little prop here. Um, I, I want to read just the last paragraph about your. Um, your, your uh, mission statement. And you say, hold on, I have to have, I have to have uh, Teddy being visible here. So uh, here it is. I publish books like Teddy the Little Refugee Mouse, books calling for peace and joy, books of the past that have been lost and are now found, yes. uh, in great part to, thanks to you, because I too want to imagine a better world and keep the worst parts of history from repeating themselves. Yes. That is a powerful yeah. part of your mission statement. Yeah. So yeah. thank you. Thank you so much for that. Well, well thank um, you. Yes, yes. Um, I know that you have an exciting series of mini college courses coming up mm -hmm. um, uh, to the Armchair Journeys curriculum. <laughs> now, I have not heard, I uh, admit, uh, yes. of the Armchair Journeys curriculum. Yes. So if you wouldn't mind, I'd like you to share a little bit about um, that uh, curriculum uh, f to our audience and where they could find out more about that. Sure. Uh, uh, sometime, uh, about a year or so ago, uh, a, a woman contacted me uh, from uh, <coughs> Boston, uh, and she said, I, ru uh, I run a, uh, I used to uh, take people to <laughs> Germany, to France, Italy, and so on, on tours, mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, I can't do that anymore, but I've, I, and uh, the name of her company was uh, artful journeys mm. and so because when they would go on these uh, trips they would uh, go and hear symphonies they would go to museums they would go to uh, special places that were unique uh, in museums uh, and so all of this went down the drain when coronavirus came but she battled back by asking uh, specialists or experts in particular, uh, let, let us say, uh, of art or music in mm -hmm. Europe, yes. and and they uh, and what they did was they would hold like uh, eight sessions on the internet, uh, one one a week, and uh, and they would you know pe there was a nominal fee, and uh, would and she asked me would I've done. I've done this already, and, and uh, I would like you to set a program. And I said, oh, that's an interesting idea. I, I, and I thought, 
uh, thought to myself, you know, I, I, I do miss teaching. Mm-hmm. It would be wonderful to get people who were interested in, let's say, in taking trips in Germany mm-hmm. to set up a, uh, a, uh, a program where they would read fairy tales uh-huh. that the uh, Germans sure. uh, had, had written and I had translated. Mm-hmm. And uh, I worked with Princeton University Press where I have a series called Oddly Modern fairy tales and I used those fairy t- those little books mm-hmm. uh, as the books that the they the p- participants would read uh, and uh, because I, I get tired of hearing myself I demanded that they were to interpret <laughs> that I would assign Great. particular participants a, a tale and then we would all discuss it and, and I would all, all chip in of course and uh, and it I'm starting a new one uh, uh, that will deal with uh, anthologies of fairy tales uh, with the same company with Artful Journeys, uh, and that starts in uh, uh, February 1st. Very good. Um, uh, this has really been fun, but unfortunately we're, we're um, coming to a close, yes. and um, th- this has really taken me back um, a few decades, I'd have to admit, about when I read some of these stories, uh, and also my my 20 years in Europe with um, most of that spent in Germany. So um, thank you so much for being here with us today, Jack. And and thank you for tuning in and watching Speaking of Authors. Please do share with your friends uh, how interesting these authors are to watch and listen about their developing stories. And uh, uh, before I turn it back to Susan, uh, can you just very, very quickly uh, say how people can find out about that, um, that series, the arm, uh, Armchair Journeys curriculum? Where do right. they go? Is there a website? Well, internet. There is a website, and it's called Artful Journeys. And, dot uh, com? Dot com. Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. So, and Susan, I know you have some last words. So back to you. Thank you so much, Barbara and Jack. I am entranced by the wide-ranging conversation you have shared with us. Animal speaking and animal rights, fascism in World War II, unrest in our own country, and a desire to make the world a better place. Jack's work fills a special niche for us. His commitment to children and to adults is evident in this interview. Again, Our thanks to the two of you for being here today, Barbara for your insightful questions, and Jack for the work you do for us. Thank you. We'll see you again on Speaking of Authors.